what we're getting into now is linear inequalities. And I want to start by um, just talking through kind of how we read the notation. So if I wrote something like this symbol right here, I read as less than. So if I read this out loud, this says x is less than 12. Now, functionally, that means that x can take on any value as long as that number is something less than 12. If I wrote this, I would read that as x is greater than. five. Now for either of those, if I switch this up to put a bar underneath it, then we read this as x is less than or equal to, oops, I missed the word less, hold that thought, is less than or equal to 12. So this one includes the value of 12 as a possible answer. This does not include 12 as a possible answer. In calculus, so in calculus, on the placement exam, in other places in your mathy life, um, sometimes we want to write things in inequality notation. Sometimes we want to write them in interval notation, and sometimes we talk about graphing the solutions. So let's just take a deeper dive into that X is less than 12 piece and talk about what those different formats for our answer would look like. Um, so this is, would be the way that I would write the answer this we would call inequality notation. If I asked you to graph the solution, then what that means if I have a single variable, right? So we're not talking about X's and Y's, we're not graphing things, like we're not plotting points on some kind of, um, Cartesian coordinate plane. We just have a single variable. So the way that I would represent this graphically is by drawing a number line. One of the things that you might be used to putting on your number line is the number zero. I'm going to try to break you of that habit because the only relevant information for the number line would be whatever's relevant for this problem. Here, the relevant number that we're working and marking against is 12. So the number that's going on my number line, the only number that's going on my number line is that 12. Now, if you like, you can certainly label the ends of this number line as a negative infinity and a positive infinity. And I think sometimes that helps when we do this next step. Um, so if I'm going to graph the solution, this is the entire number line, and I've essentially broken it up into two pieces. And I need to tell the person looking at this which piece includes the x values that match this. Well, if x is less than 12, then that means x can take on all of the values over here that are to the left of 12. I've always thought that that kind of helped. Like less than starts with an L, so it's to the left of. Um, and we would kind of shade this in to show that we're talking about the numbers over there. Because this is a strict inequality and does not have that or equal to piece, we have to demonstrate on the number line that we're leaving off the 12. And the typical way that we do that is to draw an open circle to show we're leaving off the 12. And that would be me graphing the solution. Now, if I needed to state the solution um, in interval notation, well, 
When we talk about interval notation, that means I'm going to give the interval in which all of the possible x values live. And if we've graphed the solution already, then the interval is this piece right here. And that's where I was saying that when we label the negative infinity and positive infinity endpoints, sometimes it's easier to transition to interval notation because I can see that my interval should be from negative infinity to 12. And when we're talking about interval notation, we have two things going on. We have parentheses and we have brackets, or sometimes we call them square brackets. We're gonna use square brackets. Um, we're gonna use square brackets anytime we have that or equal to. And we're gonna use parentheses when we have a less than. So when we're actually including the number, we use parentheses, we use the brackets, the square brackets. And when we're leaving the number off, we use parentheses. There's one caveat to this, negative infinity and positive infinity, regardless of what's going on in the problem, always get parentheses because we can't actually get to that number. So the correct answer would be to have parentheses on the negative infinity and also parentheses on the 12. Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to look at this. I'm going to pretend that's an equal sign and drag it along with me and do what I would never norm, do what I would ever normally do with an equal sign. So here I'm going to want to group my X's together, group my numbers together, get my X's on one side, get my numbers on the other side. So I would subtract three X from both sides. and I would add two to both sides. And if I do all of that, then on the left-hand side, I'm just gonna have an X. And on the right-hand side, I'm gonna have a six. So I would read that as X is less than six. If I needed to graph that, six would go on my number line. It would get an open circle because it's an or, um, it's a strictly less than. And since X is less than six, I would shade to the left. If I wanted to write that in interval notation, that would look like negative infinity to six. Everything gets parentheses. One more quick one, and then we're gonna talk about, well, okay. We're gonna talk about some mathy rules that you were probably told. Um, oh, but back here for just a second. This is the inequality notation. This is the interval notation. So interval inequality graph. I don't know why I put a period at the end of that. Um, so just, as, just like when we have an equal sign, we're doing the same thing to both sides. So we're going to treat this piece like it's an equal sign, and I'm going to do the same thing to both sides. Now, the next thing that we're about to do over here is kind of important. So when I look at this, and my instructions are still to solve, I know that I want Ys on one side, other stuff on the other side. Here's how I would do the problem. And then we'll pause for a second and talk about the rules. So I'm going to look at this and say, I'm going to add three Y to both sides. And I'm going to subtract seven from both sides, but I'll do it in two steps this time. So when I add three Y to both sides, I'll end up with negative two is less than seven plus three Y. And then I'll subtract seven from both sides and get negative nine is less than three Y. 
And then I'll divide both sides by three. So I'm still doing the same thing to both sides. Divide by three, divide by three, and end up with negative three is less than y. Oh, by the way, I, I, wrote, I wrote this as negative three is less than y. The other option here, I can think about this as saying y is greater than negative three. These two statements mean the same thing. And part of the reason why is if we think about how they are graphed, let me take this one right here. So we've got negative three, shoot. I said negative three, wrote negative six. That is some weird brain stuff. Okay, negative three is less than y. Well, this tells me if negative three, if that's less than what y is, then negative three should be the thing that's to the left of y. So the y values would be anywhere out here. If I take the other version of the statement, the y is greater than negative three. Here's negative three. And if y is greater than negative three, greater has an r in it, so the y value should be to the right of negative three. Either of these is correct. This, either of these give the same answer in interval notation. They would both say negative three to positive infinity. This one would also look like negative three to positive infinity. You probably once upon a time were taught that if you have an inequality and you multiply or divide both sides by a negative number, that you need to switch the sign of the inequality. That is true, but weird and an arbitrary rule. You know why I didn't have to do that in this problem? Because I wasn't afraid of putting my y's on the right-hand side. So if I just remember to move the variable to the side where it will have a positive coefficient, then I never have to worry about it. If that bothers you to have your y's on the right-hand side, then you're gonna have to remember the rule that if you divide by a negative number or multiply by a negative number, you'll have to switch the sign of the inequality. So let's walk through this problem if we did it the other way. So if I had started here and I had negative three y minus two is less than seven, and I looked at that and said, okay, I'll just add two to both sides negative three y is less than nine, and then divide both sides by negative three. But when we divide by a negative, we're supposed to remember to flip the signs, you'd get y and then flip that over and get a negative three. So we get the same answer. Um, if you do this, addition or subtraction doesn't change, doesn't ever flip the sign. So um, I don't actually care which way you get through these problems. And it is probably good to know in the scheme of things that multiplying or dividing by a negative means that you should flip the sign of the inequality. I happen to be a proponent of just move the variables around. Great. I've got a greater than or equal to in here. So I already know that when we write our final answer, it's going to have a square bracket. Or if we're graphing the answer, it's gonna have a filled in circle because of the or equal to. And I'm gonna start by distributing things out and collecting like terms so that I know which side of the inequality 
I have more X's on because that's the side I want my final count of X's to end up on. So when I distribute the four in, I'm looking at 12X minus eight minus a two X is greater than or equal to four X. And over here, that's 10X minus eight is greater than or equal to four X. So I'm gonna add eight to both sides and subtract four X from both sides. Six X is greater than or equal to eight, which is gonna give me X is greater than or equal to eight divided by six. And I'm gonna take a minute to simplify that as much as I can. Eight and six are both divisible by two. So that's gonna look like four thirds. If I wanted the answer in inequality notation, I would quit right there. If I wanted to graph it, the only number going on my number line is four thirds, unless you want to include the negative and positive infinity. And then this says X is greater than or equal to. Greater than has an R, I'm shading in to the right. I need my X's on the right. I'm gonna fill in that circle because of the or equal to part gives me a filled in circle. And if I wrote this in interval notation, I'd have a bracket for the four thirds and then be going to positive infinity with parentheses because I'm always going to have a always going to have parentheses for positive or negative infinity. Just for funsies, do you want to see that another way where we end up dividing by a negative or we're good to go? I think we'll just move on. Um, that's three times one minus two X plus five is less than three X minus one. So already I know I've got an inequality. I'm gonna have an open circle or parentheses in my final answer. I'm gonna distribute things out so that I've got three minus six X plus five is less than three X minus one. So this is where I'm gonna pause for a second and I'm gonna say, which side do I need my X's on so that my final answer comes out, sorry, so that my final coefficient on X would be positive. And in this case, that's gonna be if I add six X to both sides. So I'm gonna add six X so that I'm keeping my inequality in the same direction. 3x plus 6x is 9x. And if I combine these numbers together, I've got 3 plus 5 over here, so I'm at 8. And then if I add 1 to both sides, I'll have 9. So I read this as 1 is less than x. And if I think about my number line, one is going on my number line. It's going to have an open circle because of the or, because it does not have an or equal to. It's a strict inequality going from negative infinity to positive infinity. And now this says one is less than X and you have a choice. We can flip the whole thing around to say X is greater than one, or we can think about this as saying one is on the left of X. So if one is on the left, then X is over here. Or in interval notation, I'll have a one comma positive infinity. Sorry, why is it a uh, open circle again? So it's an open circle. Anytime the symbol that we're working with is a greater than, or sorry, is a less than or a greater than, that's gonna lead me to open circle. 
or parentheses. If we had the or equal to part with the little line underneath it, that's what tells me to make it a closed circle or use square brackets. Sorry, when do we use uh, the closed circle? So if it has the bar underneath, so if this said less than or equal to, if it said greater than or equal to, both of these would tell me we have a closed circle. Or square brackets. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I'm going to skip example five because I want to make sure that we have some time for word problems. So if you're following along in the guided notes, I'm skipping example five. Um, and we're going to get into a word problem here. So give me a second. I'm going to write it down. But if you're following along, this is example six. Okay, a whole lot of writing, so sorry. Okay, but there was, um, there's a question in the chat. The smallest number always goes on the left in interval notation. Okay, I personally, something just like never sat right with me with the word smaller number. Um, and the reason is, I don't know, like I, I know mathematically we call it the smaller number, but negative 100 just, it doesn't feel smaller to me than negative five. So what I'm gonna say is that when we're writing an interval notation, the number furthest to the left on the number line should always go first. When we write our intervals, we should always be going from left to right. So if for some random problem, I was talking about this in here, the part between negative 100 and negative five. I would be wrong if negative five was on the left. The mathematically correct notation is to go, is to read this from left to right going negative 100 comma negative five. 
And I promise we'll get more practice with interval notation. Um, but we should always have the number furthest to the left on the number line going first. Okay. Back to my word problem. When Kate exercises, she either swims or runs. She wants a minimum of eight hours a week exercising, and she wants to swim three times the amount she runs. What is the minimum amount of time she must spend doing each exercise each week? Question mark. Okay. When I approach a word problem, I start at the question mark, and I work backwards in that phrase until I find the question word. So if I start at that question mark and I just scan backwards, I'm thinking parts of speech. I'm, I'm looking for what? Great, we finally got to a question word. What is the minimum amount of time? So we're looking for a time. That's, that's the question part. We need to find time, cool. And in particular, we're looking for the minimum amount of time. And if I keep going forward here, we're looking for the minimum amount of time doing each activity, doing each exercise. So we're not just looking for one time. I'm looking for two times. I'm looking for the time swimming and the time running. That's our objective. So now I'm looking for more clues in the problem to what's going on. Let's start at the beginning then. So when Kate exercises, she either swims or runs. Great. She wants a minimum of eight hours a week exercising which means the total amount of time that she's spending either swimming or running needs to be at least eight hours. Eight hours is the minimum of what she wants. So now I know if I call the time swimming, I'm just gonna give this a variable. I'm gonna call that S and I'm gonna give the time running an R. So now I know that my total amount of time swimming plus the time running has to be at least eight hours. Now I put an or equal to here because it says a minimum of eight hours. So if she got eight hours, she'd be fine with that. She either wants eight hours or more than eight hours. That's not really enough for me to go on. So I'm gonna keep reading the problem. She wants to swim three times the amount she runs. So I need my swimming to be three times the amount running. Now, sometimes I get a little bit tripped up with word problems and more than, less than, three times more than, four less than two times the square root, right? One of the things that helps me is to just give it a concrete number and see what that would mean. So if she wants to swim three times the amount she runs, if she ran for one hour, that would mean she needs to swim three times that. So she would run for one hour and swim for three hours. Or if she ran for 10 hours, she'd have to swim for 30 hours. So whatever value she's running, her swimming part is three times her running. Now I've got an inequality I can work with. 3R plus R, that's a 4R, is greater than or equal to 8 which means her running time has to be greater than or equal to two. And if her time running is greater than or equal to two, then her time swimming had to be three times that. So 
So her time swimming would have to be greater than or equal to six, and her time running would be greater than or equal to two.